cool. Really, really excited to see everyone gathered here today to talk about their scarring from MVPs. Um, I thought I thought maybe we could just like form a circle and like talk about our feelings, but you know we can try something more productive first, which is this alternative solution um, to MVPs that my team invented uh, called Waffles, and because I was behind it, there's waffle puns all over the place. Uh, so that's not what you're into. Um, it's going to be a waffle bad time for you. Uh, I just thought of that in the moment. I wasn't even planning that. All right, cool. So uh, what are we going to talk about? We're going to briefly mention who I am. We're going to talk through an MVP. And then we're going to talk through what a waffle is and how it's different. I'm going to give you a little recipe for it. Uh, we're going to talk about when to waffle. And then we'll talk about all the ways I screwed up. Um, sound good? Great. And we're going to leave time for questions at the end, or jokes. Um, OK, very quickly, this is me. I'm less blurry in real life. Um, unclear why the picture displayed this way. Um, but I'm a product manager at CircleCI. I have any heard of CircleCI? Fantastic. You should tweet at them during this and tell them how great I am. Look at this. Who's got CircleCI open right now? OK, I was joking. Don't actually do that, or do. Um, I'm also a former founder. We built an MVP, Service CI built an MVP, and Service CI is now building waffles. Um, and fun fact, I don't actually like waffles that much, but it makes for like a lot of good jokes. Uh, so that was the acronym that we came up with. I'm also a former developer, which is kind of a backdrop to all of this. Cool. So raise your hand if you know what an MVP is. Okay, that's almost everyone, but that's kind of an important backdrop. So I'm going to give just a few cliff notes and we'll make this shorter because you already all know what it is. So if a waffle is a waffle, I would say that an MVP is like a pancake. Like it's flat, it's plain, it has like three ingredients. If you threw it at a wall, it would just flop to the ground. There's no structure to it. You can't stack it. Like you could stack it, but it would fall over very easily. Um, it's minimum. Uh, it's like the bare minimum you can put into a breakfast food, um, but it is viable to put carbs into my body, which I really like. Um, and it, does, it is a product, so you can observe actual behavior with it, such as me smiling and running more after I eat a pancake. Um, give me like a thumbs check, like I totally get it, to like I have no idea what you're talking about. Great. Seeing lots of thumbs up. So, so we've all kind of seen MVPs. This is like the like cool way to start a startup now. Um, if any of you have read Lean Startup, highly recommend it. Great book. Um, and this, and, and I actually would advocate for MVPs as well. If you're just starting a company, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, I already met someone in the hall who, who was uh, thinking differently. So maybe we can have a cool conversation about that as well. Um, the, there's a couple ways that you can go wrong with with MVPs. So one of them is that it's not actually viable. Um, you've probably seen this meme before with a burnt pizza. I 100% ripped it off and copied the entire joke and made it into a pancake because it fits better with my speech. Um, so, so who can tell me why this is not an MVP pancake? Unedible. It's unedible. It doesn't. It's not actually viable. It doesn't put carbs into my body because it's too burnt to eat. Um, so this is this is like on the product side, they did not make a viable enough MVP. More common, well, say say that your startup actually takes off. Like you read Eric Reese's book, Lean Startup, you got things going, you started making some money, things went well, say your name is Circle CI, suddenly you have millions of page views a day, and you want to add a new feature and the entire site breaks. This is another way that MVPs go wrong. It's that the code behind it was messy. Like you were like, throw this together, only three people will look at it. It's okay if there's bad architecture because that's not a big deal right now. Um, and, and it wasn't a big deal when you started, but now you're a 200 person company with millions of users and people pay you a lot and they expect the site to stay up. Um, and, and that's kind of like a story of how many of you probably came to this room. Like, oh, I was running an MVP startup and now, oh gosh, um, what do we do? So, so another great, like, but MVPs are great. I'm not here to have crap on MVPs. MVPs are a wonderful way to start a business. Zappos is a terrific example of this. Um, has anyone heard the Zappos story before? A few people. So Zappos is a website where you buy shoes, and they are hugely successful. Like, they're, they're like a startup, like, unicorn, beautiful, lovely story. They started with, like, some dude going to a shoe store, taking pictures of shoes, 
putting them on the internet, and then if somebody ordered the shoe, he would go back to the shoe store and mail it to them. <laughs> like, this is an absolute wizard behind a curtain situation. This was not technical, this was not high tech, there was no algorithm, this was like some static HTML pictures on a website, and when somebody paid him money, he would mail them the shoes. Um, so, so that is the story of a brilliant MVP, and it turns out people like pick, picking things on the internet and not leaving their house and having shoes arrive at their door. And so Zappos became what it is today, and everyone else was like, wow, MVPs work, we should do those too. It's probably true. Cool. Um, so now we're going to get into waffles. Who's heard of a waffle before other than this talk? None of you, you can't, well maybe Dan, because I know Dan. But other than that, none of you, because we just made it up. Uh, so this was something we came up with on our team at CircleCI. Um, and, and from this point forward, like, please raise your hand if you have a question along the way. You know, we don't have to wait until the end. We can just have a discussion and root. Um, so waffle. This, this concept came up because we said, we need to overhaul our UI. Um, and, and we need to not write MVP code this time. Because, not necessarily, but commonly, MVPs are associated with some crap spaghetti code that you threw together because all you expected to do was post some static pictures of shoes on the website. It's a pancake, it's not a waffle. So, so we said we want to express the idea that as we rebuild our front end and our UI, we are making it well architected, but still functionally limited like an MVP. So, Write code you're proud of, that's the well-architected part. As I said, CircleCI has millions of users that is hitting our website every single day. We have a lot of live data going on, we have a lot of streaming going on. Um, and so we need to write code that can handle that and be reliable and make sure that our site is always up. Because if someone needs to push code and our site is down because of some glitch on the front end and all we changed was one minor thing, um, that's problematic. Um, and then the second part is it's still functionally limited. So the beauty of an MVP is that you're not solving every problem in the world. You're usually solving one problem at a time. And what happens when an MVP grows, for those of you who haven't been in, in a startup like this yet, is that you add another thing, and then you add another thing, and then you add another thing, and then you add another thing, and all of a sudden there's a lot of things on the page and this thing, if you use CircleCI, the jobs list is a great example of that. That really, really applied to our MVP when we first launched on 1.0, and it doesn't apply anymore. It doesn't fit in the world that we've created. He's shaking his head. Yeah, he knows. It doesn't make sense in the new world that our MVP has grown into. So this is kind of the moment where you take a step back and say, what are people actually using? And, and assess that and add back one functionality at a time. So, waffle, pronounced waffle, like the breakfast food, W-A-F-L, well-architected, functionally limited. Is that, right? Is that like, can everyone give me like a thumb check, like are we tracking so far? Okay, cool, it's basically an MVP, but like with code you're proud of. Great, how hungry are we yet? Dan? I think you're yet to this, but how do you take functionality away from the existing system? Let's go to the next slide. That was a fantastic like, segue. Oh my god, I didn't pay him. Yeah. But then, uh, for architecting, you have a big sign. Uh, how do you, MVP is supposed to be, you want to get a good feedback from customers. Now, that architecture usually takes more time. That's a great point. Um, let's come back to that later on in the discussion where we talk about when a waffle is right and when it's not right. <laughs> At least in my viewpoint. Great. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about a couple of elements that make a waffle a waffle. Um, again, well-architected, functionally limited. Number one, start from scratch. That, that MVP Cody wrote, yeah, you could probably refactor it, and it's probably not worth your time. Every developer in this room has seen some code base where someone was like, make it better, and you were like, there's no, there's, this, is, you, this is a swamp, and you're asking me to make it a desert. There's no way this is going to happen. Um, and so we have found that it was better for our UI overhaul to just, just start from scratch and just say like, okay, this is our new code base, this is where we're coding it now, and from here on out, we will take longer, but we will write it expecting millions of users to be hitting that and making sure that our architecture can withstand that, that we have a shared design system across our micro front ends or whatever that ends up meaning to your company. This is the point where you start from scratch with code. 
Um, it's also where you kind of start from scratch with your functionality. So, so again, here's how we did it. We're overhauling the UI. We created like a separate opt-in universe. I don't, have you seen the banners yet? You're my favorite person no, to talk to the <laughs> user service. Yeah, okay. We're only showing you to like 1% of users right now. Uh, actually, no, we're at above that now, but we started at a very low level percentage of users who have a banner showing, like, does everyone remember the Twitter opt-in to get to the new UI? Like that. Like, hey, this is beta. Do you want to try this out? We think it's better. You can always leave and go back to the old one. So we created this alternate new UI universe that you could opt into whenever you wanted, and we made sure that our company, like internally, we were documenting this. Because obviously it's a software developer company, like we use our own software, and so we're in Circle CI every day. So we were actually the biggest users of the new waffle uh, for a while there, but now there's more. Um, so, and so then all we did was, so I think I need to provide some context here. Circle CI does um, continuous integration. So if we're all coding, we push our code up, before it merges to production and affects the website, it runs all the tests. And it says if your tests are passing, I'll deploy this. If your tests are not passing, I'm not going to deploy this. That's a bad idea. Um, and so people come to our interface because the test didn't pass, and they're trying to figure out why their test didn't pass. Like, why did this fail, and what do I need to do differently? Um, so we, we added about 68 different ways for you to figure out why your tests failed. Uh, if, if you've seen our UI, there's like just, just like words. There's just like a lot of words <laughs> all over the page. Um, and they're not necessarily in a specific order, they're just kind of like around, like here's something here, here's something here. You figure it out, because muscle memory is a powerful thing. Uh, <laughs> but it's not necessarily the best way to onboard your users. So in our new alternate world, we said, first, we're only going to show you the output of your steps. Like, what actually ran and what was the output from what ran. Period. Bingo. But we did that in, like, a bigger font so people could read it easier. And we did it with, like, way less information and red things, like, all over the page so people weren't distracted. And we added a little button for them to be able to open it on an entirely new tab so they could send it to their users, or, like, their coworkers and friends. Um, and the whole point of this was like, we're only going to do one thing right now, we're going to do it way cleaner and way better. And then when people opt out and say like, this isn't enough for me right now, I need to go back to my X, Y, and Z, we ask them why. Or more accurately, we look at the user data and we see what they did next after opting out. And we say, okay, so X percent of our users are cool with steps, but they really need a test summary at the top, which is like, it just summarizes which tests fail. Um, so that was the next thing that we added back. Like, this is what people do most when they opt out of our UI. They go and they look at this test summary, so that's what we'll add back after that. And then we did that again. We had that live for a while, and then we realized, like, oh, people really need to click back to GitHub. Um, and so we added the link back to your commit history to get back there, and so on and so forth down the line. But when you you test that functionality as you go to see if people can live without it. Um, and then as well in user sessions, artifacts is a great example of this. Some people use like Cypress to publish screenshots or like summaries of why tests failed and it's, it goes to a place we call artifacts. So people kept complaining they didn't have artifacts and we made sure to get on the phone with those people and have better conversations about artifacts and what they are missing from artifacts than if we had just said like copy the old design for artifacts and put it in a new UI. And the third one is Serve It Up Half Baked. Um, so, so this is something I've already kind of touched on. We started publishing this to non-Circle CI users to opt into as early as possible. Um, we started with people who um, have said, I will join your beta program for beta testing. So these are people who are more willing to deal with some things. Um, but we are going to non-beta users like next week. Um, so that's very exciting. There's a really important concept in product about being wrong. Have any of you heard the name Marty Kagan or read the book Inspired? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, so Marty Kagan is like the guy that you like read when you get into product. Like everyone's like, oh, you're new to product, have this book. It's called Inspired. It's by Marty Kagan. This is like the book you have to read. Um, and one of the things he said in there that was one of my favorite lines in the whole book is, you could be the smartest person in the world and you'll still be wrong. 50% of the time. 
Um, and this was so true. I think I'm the smartest person in the um, We thought we nailed it with this design for a parallel run picker. It doesn't matter what that is. We, we thought we nailed it on a selection tool. We put it out there, we published it. No one could figure out how to use it. Even though we had showed people designs and we had said, does this design work for you? And what would you click on? And how would it go for you? And still, and still when it was in production with their data, they could not figure it out. And so like, this is why it's so important to not trust necessarily what people say and just get it in front of them as soon as possible and observe actual behavior and see what they do with it. Um, so even though it was ugly, we got our waffle out there through this beta program as soon as possible to have people start clicking through and, and using it and misusing it, to be totally honest. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about when a waffle is appropriate and when it probably isn't. Um, so I come from the founder backgrounds, and again, I'm, I'm pro MVP for when you are still looking for product market fit. Like, if you're like, I'm not really sure this is going to work. Like, let's just like throw it out there and see what happens. Sure, write spaghetti code, take a picture of a shoe and put it on a website. Like, great, it's probably exactly the right thing for you to do. You want it to be the least amount of work you could possibly do to get viable, real feedback on actual observations. Um, however, CircleCI, we're a little bigger than that. We have companies paying us a lot of money. We already know what our product market fit is, generally. We know who our users are, generally. We know that we're growing. Um, we also accumulated a lot of tech debt over the years, uh, to the point that even seemingly small things, like can we change this logo to make it pink instead of green, it became a big deal. Like, it became a battle to do anything. Um, I like to say it's like the code base is like swimming in molasses, but the molasses also breaks your heart. Like it's just, <laughs> have any of you worked in a code base like that? Yeah, it's terrible. Uh, like no engineers want to do that. And so people would be like, do we really need to change the front? Because I don't think we do. Like it just became like a thing, capital T. Um, and, and you can't, like no matter, even if you've already found product market fit, there's always competitors. You can't have a product that you can't work in and iterate on. Uh, and just at the end of the day, it's not going to serve you well. Um, great. And, and lastly, your, your app is feature rich. Like, for example, you added three features a year for the last six years, and some of them don't apply anymore. Uh, and so that kind of goes back to the whole thing about adding back in one functionality at a time and really testing what people need so you can clean things up along the way. All right. A few more minutes. I'm going to talk through kind of our story and how we implemented this and the things that we screwed up. Um, however, if you um, have questions along the way, let me know, and I will definitely leave questions or time for discussion or debate at the end. Cool. So, in 2018, before my time at CircleCI, when I was still running a slowly failing startup, um, we at CircleCI tried a massive back end plus front end plus like everything at the same time project called Janeway. It was very exciting, and as we know happens with projects that are too big, it did not work. So Janeway ended last fall, um, and then folks said, okay, what from Janeway was actually important that we should try and do on its own? One of the things they pulled out of that was the UI. Our UI is old, it doesn't make sense, the information architecture is bad, we get a lot of this on this in our NPS ratings, um, new users are having a really hard time figuring it out, et cetera. So January, I showed up. Um, I have a lot of background in user experience. Um, Clearly not user experience with microphones, as I like it myself. Um, and, and at the same time, they have this front end team suddenly available rolling out Janeway. So they said, all right, you all, go do that thing. Um, overhaul the UI, make it better. That's a, around the time we invented the waffle concept, because <laughs> at first we were going to go MVP, uh, and then we realized very quickly we were just going to create another situation that was exactly the same if we didn't put in the, the time to make it well architected. Um, so here's the thing about well-architected, much to this gentleman's point, it took a while. <laughs> uh, and, and, and this funny thing happens with front ends, where you can't not interact with legacy code on the back end. Uh, and so there was a lot of technical complexity, and there was a lot of issues with APIs, and there was a lot of delays with cores access, and like things happened, and it took a while to do it well, and to architect it well, and to make sure things were working. Uh, in fact, it took the entire first quarter for us to do that. Um, our quarters run February to April. So it was around April that we finally got this first page live. Uh, and, 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 you know, in our defense, it was the most technically complicated page on the entire UI. 
uh, but we did it right. And that was what was very important to us along the way, even though it took a little bit longer. And the organization, we're lucky at Circle CI, backed that and said, you know, we'll give you time for this. Why did you pick the most technically complicated page? Fantastic question. He asked, why did you pick the most technically complicated page? Who has heard of a rat? Riskiest assumption testing. Okay. So this is a concept that if you have many, many things to build, the best thing that you can do is test your riskiest assumption first. Because if it turns out, like three months from now, that that API doesn't actually work, what are you going to do? You just spent three months sinking time into this project to find out that like this assumption you've been making all along was never actually going to happen. So if you are building a very complicated product, you always want to start with the riskiest thing you can first. And that was, that was why we picked this bananas page with lots of lots of complexity on it. <laughs> um, around this time, um, Q2 planning was happening, um, and people started to recognize like, wow, so this really complicated page with 68 things on it, they just published a new version with two things on it, and lots of users, like 60% of users are saying, this is better than the old page. That's astounding. We took almost everything off the page, put two things back on, and 60% of users were saying this was better than how it was before. So that was a strong indication that our team collectively was onto something. Um, the engineering was, was really solid. It loaded faster. It was less glitchy. It was more reliable. There was actual real-time updating. Um, and the product side of them went pretty well, too. Um, and so at this point, the organization said again, hey, this is great. So now we're going to invest in this a little bit more. Can you teach other teams to do waffles and also get them going um, on a new design system? We built a Chrome for other folks to use. So now there's many other teams who are also working on this new UI that we will eventually totally transition and turn off the old UI for. Bless you. Um, and, then, and then, so that took us a hot minute. Uh, <laughs> so we finally got back around to our own stuff this August. And then this beautiful thing happened. Because we had taken the time to write the code right and really understand everything that went into it and architect it really, really well, we published our second page in three days. And granted, it was simpler than the first page, but it wasn't not complicated. Like, we had to pull from three different APIs in order to get the information onto that page, and it took three days. And that, my friends, which you all know, is the power of putting time into architecting something well in the first place, is that then you can move faster in the long end. Dun, dun, dun. So, some things went well, obviously. Yeah? How did you get buy-in to take that time? I mean... It sounds like it was product driven, so that's probably part of it, but I'm curious about that as so. well. Yeah, it was controversial. Um, and we got a lot of pushback about how long it was taking. Um, yeah, I would say we're still getting some pushback, depending on who you talk to. Um, but I think that what worked in the end was our ability to point to the current system and say, there's no point in us doing any of this if you just get this all over again. Like, there's no point in us touching a new UI or building a new UI if you're just going to get the old system all over again and still not be able to move and still not be able to iterate and compete. Um, so I think it took like, and I can't even credit myself for that, I think a lot of the frustration and pent up like anger about the front end happened before I got there and it just took this level of frustration with the system as it was to get by it to fundamentally change it. Cool. Um, so things we did wrong that I would do differently. Um, so before my time, once again, um, I was busy failing a startup. They were uh, putting together these beautiful end-to-end -end designs. You should see them. They're works of art. They take you through the entire UI, completely redesigned, with, like rounder edges um, and colors. Um, and it's beautiful and it's wonderful. Um, and as we built it, we found that we didn't need some of the functionality or that some of it wasn't that important according to our users or that, you know, like artifacts fundamentally were just flawed in the way they were designed and, and a lot of the way that they redesigned it but implemented the same things all over again. Um, and so by testing along the way and designing along the way, we came up with better solutions. So in the end, I wouldn't have had our designers go all the way down deep into creating this beautiful, lovely world when we weren't even writing code for it yet. Um, that wasn't just wasn't long-term helpful. Uh, number two, so we published this beta page, right? And we said, you can opt in. By the way, it's not done yet. Um, and a lot of people said, this is better because I don't have to look at 68 things. And then there were some people who were like, 
Wow. <laughs> like this quote right here, OMG, are you guys nuts, LOL. That is an actual copy and pasted quote that someone wrote in a feedback form. Um, I thought it was funny. Um, and, and we expected that. And that, and I think like, you know, you gotta brace people for that going into it, that like, nobody likes change. Uh, and so even if you design the perfect thing, well, first of all, 50% of the time it'll be wrong. Uh, and also like some people won't like it de facto because it's different than it was before. Uh, so that's just something to brace yourself for. Um, and number three, um, as I mentioned, we, we sort of got distracted in, in this second quarter because we started succeeding. And then there was a lot of other asks of our time to like empower other teams. Um, and that, that ultimately, I, I think like developers are really smart. Engineers are really smart. Um, I don't know that they needed us to empower them at the end of it all. Uh, it sort of was just like, did we 10X you or did we just like give you, like if we had just given you a Google Doc, would that have been good? Um, <laughs> And so I, I think like staying eyes on the prize is, is really helpful. Uh, and then lastly, positive team culture. Um, I work with the coolest people that I like, I, maybe not the coolest people I know, there's some cool people in this room. Uh, but I work with really great people. Uh, we have, we started out our whole team with like this session where we sat down and talked about our values. We came up with these core four values, these four core values and we retro to the values and say like, did we over communicate this week? Did we emphasize this week? And we had like emojis for the values and we send each other the emojis when someone's embodying the values like we're cheesy it's probably partly my fault but um they're rolling with it uh and, and i think that's why we've been able to keep going through this pretty long running project that has been somewhat controversial um and and so yeah it, i mean you all already know this it always comes down to team culture cool what questions do you have from here Oh yeah. Uh, well, it's, the emojis are all just like a green box with the word flashing. I think the flashing part is important. Um, it just is. So one of them is over communicate. Uh, my team, what do you mean by this? We have an engineering manager in London, our designers in Serbia, two developers in Japan, neither of whom are from Japan, one developer in Thailand who's moving to Taiwan, um, two developers in Arizona, a developer in California, and me, I'm here in Colorado. So how many different time zones is that? At least eight, and I'm pretty sure I'm forgetting someone. Um, and, so, and so we have to over communicate, we don't really have a choice. Uh, and so everything is in Slack, things that get lost in the Slack thread get called out later. There's lots of like team huddles, like we're constantly jumping into Zoom calls. Three or four times a day, at least when I'm online, someone is calling like, get in a Zoom call, let's talk about this, let's move this card forward. Um, it's a very like, and, and like, you know, you may sometimes have that feeling like, oh, I don't want to offend you if I ask, if you did that thing, I'm going to sound like I'm nagging. Like, we have completely banned that feeling. Like, if you want to ask, you ask at the end, period. Um, the second one is empathize. We empathize with each other already, which is super cheesy. So we focus that one more on our users. Like, are we empathizing with the real problems of our users? Uh, the third one is add real value. And so it's uh, like, every time we take on a new thing that we're going to add to the page, um, like, is this actually doing anything? Like, it's just, just a thing that was on the old front end that we think we have to add. Like, we're constantly challenging ourselves and asking ourselves, both product and the engineers are constantly pushing me on, like, is, are we adding real value and this, is this the right value to add? Uh, and the last one is gratitude, so you just say thank you. How, I don't know your team structure. We have, like, a UX and UI department, if you will, on the team that does that stuff. Yeah. They tend to want to design every flow and every possible nook and cranny of how a user could you know, get through things. And that sometimes is a lot of noise for our team. So do you have a team like that? And like, how do you work with them to kind of join in the waffle and just do the minimum for what needs to be done? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was like, if you have a UX department or design department and they want to do it end to end, how do you make sure they're thinking more waffleized? Um, so I work with this brilliant woman named Alana Akilano. Uh, she's our user experience designer. Um, she's kind of a genius, uh, but she also is the only UX person across our entire company. So there's like eight teams for her to support. Um, so she does her best for us, but luckily like, I have a UX background as well. And so she came to me and was like, let's just work together. Uh, and so mostly she's, she supervises, I like to say. Like she likes to make sure we're on the right track with what questions we're asking. 
but she's also overseeing 18 other projects, so she's not super involved. Um, I think in general, I try to think of design, engineering, and product as a three-legged stool. So none of these can exist without the other. None of them can just throw designs over a wall and look for the best and say good luck. Um, I've already taken with advocating against that. Uh, and I have seen on our team that it doesn't work. What works is that we are constantly on Zoom calls with each other, talking all the time. Uh, and so we do have these beautiful end-to-end -end designs that somebody made a year ago. Um, and every time we're going to add something back in from the design, we like we have like their beautiful end-to-end -end designs, and then we have our own design, our waffle design, with three things on it, like the simplified version. And so we ignore their big design, like we get inspiration from the big design, but then we recreate our own sub-design for the waffle and say, what does this look like with just that component added? Uh, and then we get on a call with the engineers, with product, with design, and we go through it together. And oftentimes the engineers have design tweaks they want made because uh, they use our product too. Uh, so, yeah, in, in sum, I said 86 things there. So, in sum, I would say, great, have the end-to-end designs, but also have your waffle designs along the way to make sure that they are the contract that you're coding to, not the end design that's on the server or wall. So there's a situation where we should have been lawful. Yeah. And part of the reason we did this is because the the MVP board portion of the project kept moving forward. The so MVP what? The MVP portion of the project kept moving forward. Like there were other developers that were moving that forward. Were you guys able like to say, hey, no, nothing else goes on this page? That's also been uh, a struggle. Uh, the world exists outside of my team. Say love me, right? Uh, and so we've been rebuilding this whole core internal app experience. And at the same time, our pricing team has been under a lot of pressure to deliver on a new self-serve pricing model. They could not wait for us to get the new UI out there. They just had no time. That was a Q2 priority. It had to be done, period. So they they, they had to build it on the old UI. And we had a conversation like, we all know this is a waste of time because we're going to have to rebuild it on the new UI, but they rebuilt it on the old UI, and then we're all going to go back in 2324 and rebuild it on the new UI again. So we're trying the mandate from our CTO, um, who, who, had, who like came down from on high, to, I was just kidding, yeah, he's, he's great, he's like super involved with us all the time, uh, but he, um, he, he basically said, like, if anyone in this company can avoid building anything on the old UI, please avoid it. Don't do it if you can possibly not do it. Wait until the new UI or start building the new UI page that you need to do it right now. Yeah. Um, so now that you have done the model process, yeah. are there ways that, like, we were talking about, that you can approach or suggest people approach MVPs in a different way so maybe they're not quite so MVP-ish? Like, for example, I've made some matter, I've made three pancakes, <laughs> but I can start making some models. Oof. Um, the woman in me who is who is at um, CircleCI and has seen MVPs go so wrong is like, yes, build it right from the start, but I'll, I'll always be a startup gal. Like, that's been most of my career up to this point. Um, and at the end of the day, I still advocate for MVPs at the beginning. Like, until you are making money, until you are sure that you have product market fit and your growth curve is like this, yes, build an MVP because you don't know yet. Um, as soon as your growth curve starts to go up a little bit, I think that's where it's tempting to just like add more things, put some maple syrup on it. Um, and that's a good point to instead say, we can really screw ourselves over. Why don't we try and stop here and rebuild the way we should? Uh, but it, it just comes out company to company, I guess, as well. Um, however, I understand that some of you may think differently. Does anyone have an alternative opinion about building waffles instead of MVPs from the start? I guess I would just say for every circle CI, there's a hundred failed startups, right? So, yeah. I sort of view this as maybe the level of product, uh, but I think that you can say it's level from the engineering perspective. And it's, it's like the same kind of thing where uh, you can, you know, like MVP or trying to like get everything that they think and make money, but I think you should start small, prove viability. Measure success and like their like application is in use, and so like this is the best license. So yeah, like brand new and NLP. Yeah, it's the most level of product. Minimum level of product. No, yeah. it's most level of product. So you most like, level of product. You try and <laughs> focus on the features there, but like you can't just write MVP. It's like their their composition is too stiff. So 
you make something that is lightful that has to have low resistance in terms of rice uh, and stuff like that. So it's making a lot of food by so it's making a minimum file. You're actually taking out stuff that is not. Correct, yeah. And so you just do things that are like likable, which make a bunch of good. So it's like small features that are like very well done. So it's the same points I mentioned. Uh, but yeah, well that is sort of like from an engineering perspective. It's enjoyable to work with as well, which allows you to scale it. It allows you to <laughs> add new features easily. It allows you to try and experiments and see if it works. So we'll do like, away with it. It's not successful. Yeah. See, I can do that. So, like, my argument for starting with a waffle approach, honestly, is that failure is inform your next step. Like, if you fail and you stop, then you fail. But, like, if you fail and then you're able to pivot, you're able to pivot on a code base or a product that, like, you know, you decide that your product has, like, as it is right now, has failed, but you still think that there is a market for it, you still think that there's opportunity there, but you just threw spaghetti on the wall. <laughs> of course, you're going to have to start over again, but if you started a little more thoughtfully, it gives you the ability to pivot and perhaps find your market fit as well. Yeah. I just really offered this little bar on myself. Sorry, I'm distracted. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Like the counter argument here is like, but if you build it well, it's easier to iterate on. It's easier to add another thing to. Uh, and so if you lay a good foundation, it turns out your startup failed. Maybe what you just needed is to make a logo paint. Uh, and then it, like if you can quickly and like without fear <laughs> um, iterate on what you already have, then maybe you find something a little closer to. To truth by starting with a waffle. I just that makes total sense. My worry and what I've actually heard and seen is you have the engineering team fiddling around, doing things that don't have value, and building this perfect architecture that doesn't actually end up building any value. And so they've architected this very beautifully, but they've built the wrong thing. And so there is some place in the middle for sure. But I definitely I remember hearing a story where somebody was like, no, no, we have to use JRuby. And, you know, and you're like, oh, really? You had to like pick this technology that's like way out there and didn't solve the problems, but you just want to learn it, or whatever the reason it was. So. Yeah, that's not even to get the team aligned on what well architected means. Um, uh, two part answer. So part one, not within our own team. Uh, we're pretty tight knit, we talk all the time, everyone's constantly in the same room. Like it felt like we were pretty aligned along the way. There was like some back and forth, but since we're over communicating everything, everyone knew everyone's opinions all the time. And it was pretty clear what direction we should go in, or at least I never saw anything get like bigger than itself. Um, there were some product decisions that they pushed me real hard on that we, we disagreed on the, what that was, but uh, less so on the engineering side. Part two of this answer, um, outside of our team, people sometimes disagree with the decisions that we made. So for example, we chose to go with a micro front-ends approach um, instead of a monolith. Um, that was controversial. People had had some nightmare experiences with, with microservices, with micro front-ends, with everything with the word micro in it. Microscopes. Um, there's just there's just like this gut reaction, like no. Um, and I it, it took it took a lot of meetings um, for people to become aligned on on that. Um, I'm not a software architect. I have done code, but I never got past being a junior developer. Um, and so now I'm on the product side, so I sort of stayed out of it. Um, but but yes, there were discussions. And I really, really credit our technical lead on our team. We have a team lead and a technical lead, and they both actually contribute to like constantly driving the discussion and scheduling another meeting and getting someone on the phone to talk one on one or to talk in a group or whatever it took to just move things forward. Yeah. Here. Yeah, I'm curious in those first uh, like four months or so, three months, I guess, that, that took you to kind of uh, deliver that first. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
if there was like uh, prototype techniques you used throughout there to, to sort of uh, line on what was going to be part of that like, functional limitation, like how did you decide on that stuff? Mm -hmm. um, did it take a lot of ironing out, or were you blocked on that decision? He wins! Uh, two, two puns in one sentence. Fantastic work. Um, so the question was, uh, how do I rephrase this? So the first prototype you put out there that took you three months, how was your process of getting to that prototype? Um, so the first thing we did was we look at this big, beautiful design that somebody made for us a year ago. And we were like, wow, that's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Um, and then we put it aside, put it on the shelf. And then we went to actual users. And we said, show me how you solve your job. Um, so to not like tell me about it or like tell me on this page what's important, like get on a Zoom call, share screens and say like, walk me through this error, this job has failed, show me how you go about solving it. And when you do that and you're asking them questions along the way about what they're actually using, it became clear very quickly what the number one functionality on there was. It was like a number one functionality, a close second, and then everything else was like, yeah, I sometimes use that. Um, and that stuff is all still important. Like we have very vocal users who are like, you know, 3% of our users use artifacts on any given day, but man, have I not heard the end of not having artifacts on the page. Um, so so there, there is still like, a, you know, you still have to get a lot of other stuff on there, but it became clear within just a handful of user sessions what the two most important things were. You build the first one and then you build the second one. And it was like, bam, there it is. Um, and then again, it goes back to getting it out there sooner rather than later and seeing what people complain about when you don't have it on the page. So there's the whole process behind like design thinking that I think is really important. Asking whys and whys behind the whys and all of that. Um, I should mention as well, so we had a hypothesis about what that core functionality was. And again, we left the beautiful end design on the shelf. We created a new design of just the waffle version. We started showing that to people. And rather than asking, do you like this? We asked, show us how you would solve the error on this page. And we saw what people wanted to click on in our design. It's in visions, some of the designs are clickable. Um, and we watched what they did and we said, what are you thinking, what's going on? Uh, and that, that validated a lot of our assumptions. We would always ask too, like, so you solved the error, you didn't need anything else? Um, and they were like, well, on this super simple hypothetical error, yes, it was fine. Um, of course, once they had a real user data, there was other stuff they needed, like apparently artifacts. Uh, so, not, I'm not really bitter about the artifacts. Thing. It's <laughs> an ongoing thing. It's that hand back there. Um, so once, once you had support, once you had buy-in, once you had the success, and you had a place full of bottles. Yeah. Um, yes. How, how? So the question I have is, how did you take your plate of bottles and enable the other teams that were questioning? that were scared to jump in, did you, did you install a waffle buffet or? <laughs> um, that in and of itself was a question. Like the engineering department turned to our team and said like, empower the other teams. Um, and we said, okay, um, with a question mark at the end. Uh, and so, and that's where I think a lot of the question mark about whether that time is valuable uh, really comes into play. Um, so here's a couple things we did. One was that we invested about a month in creating a shared design system. Is anyone familiar with design systems? Um, so yeah, so it's like shared design components across several different teams. So we were able to say, okay, so if you need to pull that button in, here it is, you can pull that and, help, and it would be faster. Um, the second thing we did was we added things to that design system so that they could be pulled. Um, but I think the thing that was most important that we did was that we got on the phone with them um, and, and just like talked to them through it. You know, it turns out change is kind of scary, uh, and people have like reservations, especially about microfronts. Um, and so, we made them a guide. We wrote out what steps you would need to follow in order to get your microfront live. And then, and then people read the guide and then said, "But can we just talk to your tech lead?" Uh, so a lot of it, at the end of it all, just ended up being like one-on-one -on -one conversation on a Zoom call, more so than any technical empowerment that I think we created. Yeah. Oh, we're over time. Um, it's been fun. Thanks, everyone. Uh, enjoy the party over at wherever they're going. <laughs>